So, second try. Hi, my name is Christo. I'm going to talk to you about software development, about how did we improve our development process, about a system that we built called Daedalus. Well, we haven't actually built all of it, but uh, we are going to get there in the end. And I'm going to talk to you about what we did, why we did it, and how it improved our development schedules, how it improved the, the, the quality of the code, and how it improved the confidence in the developers about w the, 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 the things that they were building. So I'd like uh, to, to make some introductions first. This isn't working. OK. So as I said earlier, I'm Christo, and I'm part of the uh, team that is building the server-side solutions of the software in our company. We are building forex trading companies. Okay, cool. Thanks. So, so we are building the software that's behind of our forex trading platform. And a little bit of words for, uh, about it. It's uh, written in C sharp. Well, it's a little bit strange for uh, forex trading to be written in C sharp, but we've done it. And also, uh, we are building different solutions to help us improve our development process. So I see a very different audience here. Can you tell me how many of you are developers around here? Quite a few. OK. And how many of you are architects or people who have architect in their name right now or have been architects before? OK, those are the bad guys. The good thing is that there are only two or three of them. So those are probably the guys you've been to uh, when they asked you to build something, right? And they asked you, OK, you have to build this for the next release or for two or three releases after, right? You have some task, you have to do it. And you, you carry it on as, uh, as your day-to-day -day activities. We are going to talk to you. Uh, we are going to talk about what happens when you can't complete your task on time. Why? Because of requirement changes, because of uh, unclear functionalities, because of things that you haven't understood before, and how does it affect the uh, actual software process? What happens when things break? Why this is important? Because it helps us um, measure not only uh, how we are doing when everything is known in a perfect universe. This, this is a measure of uh, how agile we are when we are uh, speaking about uh, developing in uncertain cir uh, circumstances, in uncertain uh, environment where we know in advance that things are going to break, but we have to develop them eventually, right? So in order to, to cover everything that he has to develop in the end, as a part of an organization or as a part of uh, some uh, collaboration between companies. And the bad thing is that in order to get his work done, he has to stop everything and start fixing your changes. So this is bad, right? And this is why we are saying that developing systems is hard, because sometimes you have to face those things. You have to face the wrath of the people who are uh, relying on you to make good changes. And this is why we have to make very careful decisions about when we are breaking stuff, about the actual time. W w what is the right time to do it? Would the people who are going to use our software have time to incorporate those changes? Or if not, we have to sit those endless nights like coding, you know? How many of you have stayed until 2 a.m. in the morning to, to cover code fixes? Those poor souls over there. How many days, like two or three days in a row, maybe even more? Somebody? And that guy actually stood, you know? He is, he's in deep pain. 
This is because of us. This is because we haven't planned our stuff right. We haven't anticipated all of the changes that we had to do. And now we have to, to, to let him work in order to cover our own mistakes. This is why that guy over there was pretty grumpy. So we want to make sure that those things that we are doing are bound in some context that the people who are actually relying on us can make decisions and can, uh, can uh, incorporate those changes in a manner that is the most painless to them. And this is why there are a lot of strategies to mitigating uh, breakage. So, first of them, most of those strategies revolve around making code uh, changes and uh, basically infrastructure changes or all kinds of changes in certain way that you have to build them upon small incremental steps, right? Now, I don't know how many of you actually have developed in the 90s or the uh, actual 2001, 2002, anybody? One guy, yeah, two guys, okay, so, <laughs> silence. So, we actually know that in those times, things like Scrum or Agile were being invented. And in that time, what we were stuck with was uh, in a waterfall model, right? You have to plan first, then you have to execute, then you have to test, validate the changes, then in the end you had to release them. And in every step, there were buffers. Why? Because of breaking changes, because of stuff that you didn't anticipate in the beginning that crept up in your schedule and actually exploded it in the end. Something that you thought that could take like a week took two months because of things that you had to fix in the end. So, yeah, we are trying to make those changes small, and this is most of the, uh, the, the biggest reason that most of the uh, newer development strategies are focusing mainly on uh, uh, software cycles of one, two, three weeks, something like that. But actually, is somebody around here that is doing changes in, uh, the, the, that are taking more than one release to do? like some big complex thing that it takes you like two or three versions to validate? Anybody? Two guys. Okay, so those poor souls also, they have to suffer. Why? Because actually we are building our software in such a way that those guys are doing stuff that is lagging behind everybody else, right? What they are doing is they are making things in a separate branch. If, if you are working with branches, that's cool. <laughs> I, I hear some laughs, but I know actually people around here who are working in one single branch still. And it's causing them much pain. So those guys are working in a separate branch. And when, it, when time, time for a release comes, they are merging their stuff together with everybody else, and they are starting to backport fixes, and suddenly their work is double. Why? Because they have to test their code again. It's not good, right? So this is why we have to make sure that, th th this is why those strategies are more or less good for most of the uh, things that we are doing. But if you are be, uh, building your version around hard clocks that tick like every three weeks we have to make a release no matter what, even if we are releasing one single button uh, or we are making it green. It's a valid change. People are doing releases for that thing. And it takes them three weeks to do. But anyways, this is one of the, uh, the, the things that is uh, helping us uh, reduce the risk of breaking changes creeping onwards. There are other stuff, like, for example, reduce the scope. If something is very big and requires quite a big risk in order to do it, you have to reduce it. 
and, and if somebody from the business comes and says, hey, I've got this very great idea of building this very cool, nice thing that is working and is going to, uh, to, to attract a lot of users, and he starts explaining it to you, and you're sitting and thinking about how it will break everything to implement it. And in the end, what, what is usually done in these interactions is that he gets probably a button or some kind of a report or something else that's not that trivial. And you know what? He doesn't get all those leads that are making money to the company because you were afraid to make changes, right? So. Obviously, uh, if you don't want to end up in this situation pretty fast, because otherwise the business will actually fire you as a software company, you have to make things run in parallel. This involves pro not only coding branches, because as I said, it, it's painful. It also involves code toggles, you know, if dev or uh, some kind of uh, statements like, if my client is, let's say, for example, that building company over there, we have to change the, the, the logic a little bit different for, for those things, right? There are people who are building software for multiple companies. Anybody of you to, is working on a system that is actually being sold to different companies and not to, to a single vendor or whatever, anyone? One guy, two guys, three guys, four. Okay, so they were very shy about it, and they know they are shy because sometimes they have to, to to tweak that logic a little bit in order to fit that specific client's needs. The 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 bad thing about feature toggles is that once you accept them and once you start building upon them, you make those pretty fancy screens when you toggle on and off features, and Guess what? Your time for release quadruples if you have only two options, right? If one feature is turned on or it's turned off, you have to check this, this, uh, these variations with the combination of all the other possible solutions for the other feature toggles that you built. Why? Because sometimes people might actually enable two features together that are fighting. They can't work together. So. Again, you have to go to the drawing board, right? Or you have to, to increase your test uh, scenarios to, to, to increase the time it takes for you to market those things. <laughs> Why? Because of those changes that actually you are afraid to make in a consistent manner with everybody. And this is, uh, this is pretty bad. Most probably, if you have those feature toggles, your database supports everything, like all the possible combinations. I know that it's sometimes very hard to do it right, like involving different databases or different stuff. And it's pretty ugly when somebody tells you, I didn't want this thing built that way. Can we make it a little bit different? And then he starts explaining to you. And it's totally different from what you understood in the beginning, right? This is pretty horrible. Why? Imagine that you have a huge database with 300 terabytes of data, and you have to change it. You have to make. So first, what you did was a migration from one version of the database to another, and then you have to roll back those changes. The bad part is when this thing happens two days before the release, right? You know that you are not going to make it, so you have to roll back immediately everything. And the worst part of it is that it's really troublesome to do so. So everybody who has started working in whatever company thought in the beginning that they were building this, right? No matter if it's a product that is well established in the market, or something that is, uh, uh, that, that is brand new, that you have this great idea, okay, they present you with this, and this is what the customers see also. This is a very good thing, right? It took people about 300 years to build it. So it wasn't done in a single batch or in a single release. It probably looks like something like this now. Because of all those feature toggles, and all of those things that had to be assembled together in order to make it. Yeah, you have that church, but you have this strange thing inside of it, or 
on the left. It's not very good, right? And this is what our software looks like. Are you proud of it? Probably not. But it sells, it makes money. You get salaries from that. So it should be good, right? In some abstract way. So eventually, software tends to break. I put here occasionally, but for some of us, me included, it turns to break a little bit more often than that. And it makes us stay long nights to fix stuff. So we thought about what could we do in order to fix those things. Why? Because, because this thing leads to frustration, and we don't want that. So we started analyzing the development process that we had. And it always looked something like this. You get the latest and build. What do I mean? You have, for example, 150 libraries, or maybe two of them, that are working together, that are presenting data to your front end, and your front end included in that. It, it, uh, it becomes quite a mess to, to untangle them. And then we start making breaking changes, right? We start making stuff that are disrupting the process. And by doing so, we are introducing good things that the business wants, and we are introducing bugs, right? That we have to fix. So once we have implemented our greatest feature, what we are doing, we are testing it, we are seeing that it doesn't work, and we are putting patches on top of it. So this is why our great building in the beginning became that horrible thing in the end, right? Because of all those patches. Because we think that whatever we built latest is the greatest and everything of everything that we've done before. And if you ask, for example, people who are in the car industry, they are going to tell that there is a very specific market for aged cars, right? Vintage cars, so stuff from, one, nine, from 1860 that are not built anymore. Cars without ABS, but that they, they look very good and they were like 300 horsepower or something like that. So probably there is some fascination in the stuff that we did before. Maybe then we did something better than we, than we are doing it now. So then what we started doing is going back in the source control, right? We want to see what broke, why did it break, when, stuff like that. And what happens is that we are finding differences and we are fixing them in the trunk. So we are backporting fixes over and over and over again. So people actually build continuous integration systems to uh, make the tests that are uh, th that we have to run after every or let's say after five commits or every night to to make parts of those tests automated. Why? Because first of all, it's very tiring for a single guy or for a bunch of people to just click around our software and make sure that it works. I'm not going to discuss with you the benefits of the CI. What I'm going to tell you is that if you start implementing such a system, you quickly find out that the, uh, I I if you do it by the books, it, it doesn't provide you with the useful information. Why? There was a joke for Java for a long time where somebody knocked on a door, right? You probably all know it. But after a long pause, it said Java. So this thing is the same with the CI now. Whenever you are committing changes, it takes something in between an hour or to three hours to trigger all the tests, the, the, to, to trigger all the test cases, to evaluate them and to tell eh, something broke. And you're not doing one commit per day, right? Anybody doing only one commit every day? Come on. Nobody wants to admit that. Why? Because our salaries depend on that, right? So, and w what does this mean? That the CI is probably more or less useless, right? It doesn't generate the things that it wants uh, from it. Pro most, uh, the, the biggest part of it is to catch the errors as early as possible. So what happens if a manual or automated QA tells us, listen, your code is broken, you have to fix it? 
all of those things right there, right? F the first comes the frustration when you know that you had built something wrong and you probably are going to get lynched for that or maybe fired, probably better. And then the, 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 the bad thing is when those things happen, like I said, uh, in, a, in, in such a way you learn the news in the end of your development process or in the end of your deployment or whatever, even past that time. So the, the time to fix the mistake is pretty short and narrow, and it also adds a lot to that frustration. Why? Because you know that you have to build everything to assemble it together, and probably people made stuff for the new version that uh, you have to roll back in order to get your changes done. Why? Because you already built everything from latest, and people are not waiting for us to, to, to fix our code. We think that we are more or less gods and what we are doing is without any reprise and it's always the best thing and it always works. Well, it doesn't work that way. Also, it doesn't work that way when we are facing database changes, right? I'm keeping to, to, to put those databases in here for people who don't know what database is. Good luck. Right, I don't think that there, that there is anybody around here that is actually doing it, but what uh, we thought was, okay, rolling back changes is a nightmare, really, for everybody. We have to make sure that uh, uh, we, we start analyzing the stuff from the moment it broke, and this investigation cost us quite a lot of time. Also, once we, uh, we eventually find out what the cause of the error is, we have to revert all the commits, and pray that it's going to work, because sometimes it may involve tracking the database changes that we did. And we don't keep these things together, right? Because our source code is actually uh, guarding only the, uh, our source control is actually guarding only the, 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 the code that we are writing every day. Well, there were some very good companies actually who started thinking about making database changes in the source control also, they are not very good at all the things that they are doing, but it helps. It also helps to, 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 to keep track of the different things that you are putting in the database that are more or less static, like for example, lookup tables and stuff. But those things live in a different areas, right? One is, is uh, usually managed by the DBA people, the other is managed by us as coders. And what about changes to the infrastructure? Do you know where our programs are actually run? Not on paper, like the, the, the old days in the 80s where you had punch cards, where you had to punch some holes in them in order to make changes in your program. This thing runs on real computer hardware, probably on your phone, your laptop, servers, whatever. And those things tend to change also, right? You install software updates and things start breaking. So maybe there is some, some way to do it correctly if we are combining those things together. Now I'm thinking about those things. And I'm thinking also the, in uh, the, what it means to actually revert the changes. Why? Because we are constantly forgetting stuff behind. We are forgetting code that is no longer reachable. We are forgetting stuff inside the database, and we're always saying, okay, we're going to fix it later, because we don't have time. And we're writing a lot of compatibility layers to fix those previous mistakes, to, to actually make sure that we are isolating the changes in some dark corner, or probably behind the rug, or something like that. And it's not very good. What if we roll back instantly? Do we have this possibility to actually say, OK, I'm going back five days ago? And it doesn't only mean five days ago in terms of code, because, because that's easy. You are just looking at the history. You see all the changes that you did in those five days. You are reverting them. Everything's fine, right? We want to make sure that 
the changes in the database are also tied to this. We want to make sure that the changes to the network infrastructure that is uh, doing the, the communication part between the, the different uh, computers our software is building on, or the actual uh, configuration of the systems is also part of this equation. This will help a lot. And why is going to help a lot? Because we know that our software runs on, the same, uh, or, or, or on a device and we want to pack those changes together. There are actually companies, for example, Microsoft and Sony, who are building end-to-end -end solutions. Even Apple does it with phones, right? You, when you are going to an uh, Apple store, you get either a Mac or an iPhone, and it, it comes with software, right? They're selling you everything together. So for those of us who are not selling gadgets, it might be a better idea to start thinking about what if we actually sold virtual gadgets with the, the, the required configuration inside, with the required database changes inside. It would help reduce the fear of the people who are actually building the software and who are uh, testing it and who are making sure that those things fit together in terms of uh, DevOps or IT support or whatever, because we know every time that we can go back pretty instantly. Now, there are solutions for this that are built upon uh, snapshots of virtual systems, but they are pretty costly and you can't do it on every commit. So it's probably a very good idea to have those things related in a single place where you can reason about them, where you can uh, track them together, how they were done. And this is part of laying our requirements for the system that we are building. Now, we want to make sure that we are minimizing the rollback time. This is one. Two is keeping things together, right? We want to make easy snapshots. This is pretty easy, right? You just bite on it and you get a snapshot. Imagine if you did it on every commit, to be able to roll back this specific, to this specific commit instantly. Or probably with a little bit of manual work when you're doing database changes. Like, for example, when you have something that is uh, changing the way the data is structured, you always have to make sure that you have a backup plan. Like going forward, going backward, for every single thing. Right? We need repeatable builds. And this doesn't only include the code. It includes database. It includes, again, the platform that we are building it on. In terms of source code, we don't actually need to grab the latest stuff and build it. Because this would enable our teams to work with different paces independently of one another. And tell, here is a version that we think that is working, and then move on with their changes. This can happen with all of the teams. Eventually, you have to synchronize at some point. But most of the time, the people who are using the things that you are building right now don't have to cope and to integrate all those things that you broke now in that specific moment, because they can't actually build their software and move on because of it. They might pick what the best time it is for them to start integrating those stuff together. And then they can focus quite a lot more on their doing right now, and not on how what you did is going to affect them at this specific moment. How many of you think this is a good idea? Nobody, okay. It takes time to, to see the values in that. Eventually, when you start building software that you are going to maintain it in five or six or 10 years from now, you have to think about maintainability, about what does it cost you to do it right the first time. And if you don't, what does it cost you to roll it back? So change management, I'm thinking about 
what if we didn't keep all those things in one single big repository? Because otherwise, if you look at the history, it's going to look very messy. I changed this server, and then I changed that UI library. I changed that website. Those things are not correlated together. We want them separately. It actually takes quite a lot of time and effort to split your code in such a way that it's uh, in uh, small and isolated chunks, and you can reason about them uh, separately and develop them in their own pace. But what it does in the end is that it shows you that not every single release, all parts of the system are changing. You probably have code in your system that you haven't touched since quite a long while. And it's not rotten, probably part of it is very good. But you know that you haven't changed it. And you know that it works with five or six future, re future releases that you're going to do, right? And this is good. What it also give us is the, uh, gives us is the possibility to, to, to actually track, uh, to, to build dependency graphs of what has changed and what this change uh, is impacting. Like, for example, if you know the, 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 the things your website is depending on and you change something, you immediately would know that this change would have to be integrated in the website. And probably if this website is consumed by another application that you are building, you have to change that one. So it's kind of a wave propagation of all of your changes, and this happens right now. Probably most of us don't actually notice it, but people who are software architects, and this is why I asked them about them, is, uh, about how many of you are software architects, they have to struggle to keep all of this picture inside their head every time, and they have to know the system in such a manner that all of the changes that they are doing in uh, the, the, the core libraries, in the things that are used by other people, don't, uh, the, 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 when you change them, that ripple doesn't bring something else like five or six layers above. And we also know something very good, that the breaking changes are actually known, parts of them are, are known, before it hits the CI. For example, unit tests of a library three layers above your change are failing now because of your change, and you have to fix them. You don't have to go to release every component inside the CI environment and start testing it. It saves quite a lot of time if you accum accumulate it. Now there is some demo that I'd like to show you. Before that, just keep in mind that we haven't actually uh, arrived at the point where we are keeping all of those things in the same time related, and I probably don't have time to show everything to you. So we are going to talk about how we are reasoning about our code, what did we implement to make it better, and how small structured libraries are actually uh, used to build bigger solutions that are then used to build something even grander than that. So we have, ah, sorry. Ooh. We have some code around here. A little bit about it. We have a system that is built is a classic example of a system where we have a database, where we have uh, a, a compatibility layer of uh, all of the things that are uh, common to all of the projects, like, for example, data transfer objects, things that our business is using, and also uh, the, the, the servers that are managing those objects, like querying them, updating them, keeping them in sync. Uh, this system in, is involved of several components that are used together, and they are part of a pipeline. One of them is making changes that the other component is grabbing and building upon them and doing releases and stuff like that. So we don't have time to make big example. I will show you something else. Our code 
is structured in such a way that here you can see two solutions, right? Logic and host. So obviously host depends on logic. This is inter-solution dependency. I'm going to unload you to show you something else. This is how we are making changes in such a way that it does that, that, that we know that they are breaking stuff. Like for example, the the the, the actual thing is called Sara. It's about uh, reasoning and uh, reacting to changes to uh, very fast in when uh, the market is uh, is changing it's actually uh, reacting to some kind of events what i want to show you here is these things clients core date objects whatever they are actually solutions uh, and they are actually projects in those solutions that are part of this grant library. So we managed to split them to separate repositories. Great. Now what we are doing is tying every, every build and every commit of this host process to not only the changes that you built, uh, that, that you done in this service, but also to, the to, to a concrete version of every dependency that we have in the system. So think about things like NuGet, about uh, uh, like uh, RPM, like uh, uh, jar files, whatever they have strict versions. This thing also has strict versions. And whenever we are building something, we are releasing a new version of the tools. And it is not necessary that it doesn't necessarily mean that those changes are going to be propagated in the end to all of the solutions, right? You are just releasing your library. So somebody uh, at a specific point in time decides that it's time to, 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 to bump the version of uh, the dependency, and it changes this hash over here to a specific one that is basically based on the commit of the thing that you are doing. And the, this way you, you are controlling how we are propagating the changes. Now you can tell me that there are things like uh, git sub modules and other stuff that can do it, right? But it's always, uh, we've done it in such a way that we can reason about it in code. So this is our approach. And basically if you change the core library with this hash, you have to make sure that in order for these changes to be propagated, you have to integrate that change in all of the components that, uh, that are depending on that library. And then you have to make that change iteratively once more for the components that are, it, uh, that are depending on the, the previous components and so on and so forth. Now, we don't have this automated, so I'm not going to show it to you because it's quite a tedious thing. I want to show you something else. How we can reason about changes that we did only in one project and it wasn't something that every, uh, another thing depends on. Like we're going to change the host, okay? So this is, our, is, is part of the, of the source code that we have. So here we have some string that we want to change. I'll change to local host. It doesn't, I, I won't show you what this entails. We are just making changes to the source code. Now, this solution is something as, uh, we are calling part of a bundle, and the bundle for us is something that is actually a composition of different things that we are releasing together. That's the definition of a bundle. Now, our bundle is actually, uh, you can imagine uh, it is some kind of a forest where you have trees of end components with their dependencies. And they have, those trees are not growing up above, they are growing below and their roots are tangled. This, the, the same way as the dependencies of a given library are, uh, the, of a given project may also be part of uh, the dependencies of another project, but not to all of them. So, for example, in this project everything depended on, on core and if we made changes we had to propagate them to all of the solutions. Now we know what those solutions are, which is good. We also know that if we change the, uh, the, those things in one place, 
and not change it, or several places, but forget one or two of them, this thing shouldn't ever touch production. Why? Because we would have mismatched versions of those core libraries. So they are not going to speak the same language, and it's bad. This is part of the optimization for the CI that we did. Now, I'm going to commit those changes. Uh, just a second. So we are saying that we changed the host. Okay, we are committing it. Now this is local. The good part of using Git as we are doing is that you can do it locally on your environment and replicate all those changes together. What, but we can also publish them to the server. And now the server starts to build it. Do you see it? No, right. Don't see it. Crap. OK, I have problems with the resolution. Uh, this is weird. OK. Is it visible? So the changes we committed over there are grabbed by the CI and it starts building them on the server environment to start and make sense of them. Right? We only changed one server that is called event rule executor in this case. So while it builds, I'm going to, to, to tell a little bit about the, the system that we developed. So basically, you have components as we, uh, are, uh, as we are calling them. A component may be anything. It may be a library, it may be an asset, it may be a database uh, definition, it may be all of those things together even in one repository. So the components evolve over time, and there can be dependencies between them. Now, this thing is implemented only for Visual Studio projects, for C Sharp. Yeah, it's a limitation, but this is what we are using. So uh, this thing actually helps you in an automated manner to see what are the dependencies of every given project in any given time. It also allows you to, to uh, propagate those changes automatically to the dependent solutions. And it also allows you to trigger CI builds that uh, run the, the unit tests, the integration tests, and stuff like that. So far, nothing is actually, uh, n nothing is actually uh, different than all of the other CI systems that are on the market. What we did on top of that is we, we, managed, we thought that it might be a good idea to actually start reasoning about the dependencies that those components are built of and thinking about the, way, about the, the, the question of whether those things are able, we are able to deploy them together on one environment. It's not always the case. Now, this specific thing we would be able to deploy it. Why? Because we made the change in an end component that nothing else depends on that one. So provided that everything else stays the same, you can put your change on your CI environment, CI environment and make sure that the things that you, uh, the, 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 that your change is actually compatible with the rest of the system. It doesn't break anything else. Now, obviously, the build takes more time. So this is why I haven't shown you what is happening when you are changing a core library. We had to wait for five or six of those guys to complete. Alternatively, you can build parts of the solution, right? They can evolve in different paces. So this means that in that specific case, uh, you are able to, to develop them separately. And there will be a point, and this is a, the, the good part, where this thing together can be deployed on the CI environment. A grand day is worth celebrating. Why? Because then everybody actually aligned together all of the things. And we know that those changes are actually uh, that they are actually integratable, that there is no, ah, 
this finished. Okay, so there is no way that those things are not going to work together because of missing versions of things that you didn't compile, but you are using in other parts of the system, stuff like that. Those, the, the, those things are going to be left out. Now, obviously our build is finished, and now we'll show you what happens in, in, in that case. When the build finishes, there is a special process called bundle assembler that actually checks whether the thing that we just built is compatible with all of the things that we've built previously. And it might not be compatible with the latest versions of all the things that we built previously, but it might be compatible with some older versions of those things. Actually, we can compute it by comparing the trees and finding whether we have dependencies that are uh, mismatched, whether we have circular dependencies between projects and so on. So now we have this thing that was built. It says 9.59 and the current time is, uh, what was it now? No, get time. Can somebody help me? Get date. I really don't like the syntax. Okay, so things that were built in the last two minutes. This is probably our stuff. So together with all those things, we can publish it. I've done this thing that is actually publishing stuff, right? So now we can see here 60, uh, 46 was the bundle of all those, of all these things together. You can see a lot of different solutions. And you, w what you don't see here is all the libraries that are composed of. There are quite a few of them. But our change, which is here, is part of a bundle which was assembled of this change with all of the previous uh, things that we had together built that we know that, were, that, 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 that they are at least passing their unit tests. So now this is a good candidate for the CI environment. Okay, we can deploy it and see that it runs in the CI environment. I'm not going to show this too because it takes quite some time to, to test it. And I messed this up again. So this is the end of the demo. Takeaway notes. I want to, to tell that it's, there really is a value in developing software in such a way that you know at every given point in time that you can roll back instantly. This will reduce the pressure of the people that are doing the development, that are doing the testing, the integration afterwards, and all those things. It will, it will help them live a better life by not making uh, by not worrying about what would it take them to, uh, to, to make their latest work compatible with everything else. Obviously, using smaller pieces for assembling of that information is a crucial part of it because it now will force us to, to reason about what is changed and what that change uh, affects and what uh, and, and it will help uh, see what the impact analysis of that thing will be. It will also help our project plans because we would know what it will take us to make uh, that change better. And in the end, we, alre we always have to profit from that. Now, questions? And I'm available afterwards for talks of how we did it, why we did it, probably some more demos afterwards. So now, please, thank you uh, for your time and attention.